will start let the people come and join us. so it is very good morning to all it is our great pleasure to welcome you all again for the knowledge 4.0 webinar series which is one of the unique and distinct initiative of uh, chennai institute of technology under the guidance of our honorable chairman sri p sri ram who is one of the well known first generation entrepreneur managing director of mk group of companies under knowledge 4.0 we have been conducting webinars such as technical webinar series career guidance webinar series research webinar series innovative talk webinar series and alumni webinar series along this webinar series we are also conducting uh, national and international seminars national and international workshops and faculty development programs so today we have uh, dr manoj gupta who is one of the well known professor from nis so he has associated with so many research organizations and it is my great pleasure to welcome him in this wonderful forum i welcome you sir for this wonderful forum and we feel proud to have dr manoj gupta in this uh, wonderful forum uh, who is one of the person excellently working on magnesium alloy in the world and uh, this programs are purely conducted to enhance the knowledge of faculty members researchers and and students community and uh, chennai university technology was established in the year 2010 Uh, by our honorable chairman sri piri sri ram today our institute is being within top 10 among all other private engineering colleges in tamil nadu it is my proud to welcome you all to the wonderful forum and uh, and welcome uh, dr uh, professor manoj gupta from nus singapore to this wonderful uh, forum and now i request ms varsha sri to introduce our today expert A very good morning, everyone. This is Varsha, pursuing second-year mechanical engineering at Chennai Institute of Technology. Excellence is not being the best; it is doing the best. One such person among us is Dr. Manoj Gupta, associate professor, Department of Mechanical Engineering, National University of Singapore. Was a former head of materials division of Mechanical Engineering Department and director designate of Material Science and Engineering Initiative at NUS Singapore. He did his PhD from University of California, USA, and postdoctoral research at the University of Alberta, Canada. In August 2017, he was highlighted among the top one percent scientists of the world position by the Universal Scientific Education. His current H index is 59, and RG index is 46, and his citations are greater than 25,000. In 2018. He was announced as the World Academy Championship winner in the area of biomedical sciences by International Agency for Standards and Rating. A multiple award winner, he actively collaborates with Japan, France, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, China, USA, and India. We are glad to have you, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Now uh, you can uh, go for uh, scanning your screen and session, sir. Okay. So I share the screen. This one here, and uh, click on this and share. Yes, sir. Okay. Is it okay on the screen? Yes, sir. Please, sir. You can go out, sir. Please, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just give me a second. Well, a very good uh, morning to everyone in this virtual webinar. Uh, as introduced, I am Manoj Gupta from National University of Singapore. I am working here for almost twenty-seven years, and it's my pleasure. Um, Uh, to be here to be talking with you on an area of uh, immense interest in the research community and uh, i like to thank professor dinakaran to uh, approach me and uh, uh, allow me to use this platform to disseminate this knowledge the title of the talk is a promise of magnesium technology for 21st century magnesium is one of the very important element which is emerging very strongly in most of the advanced countries and uh, the purpose of uh, this talk is to educate the people in many countries who, who have not yet positioned themselves in this area magnesium has almost 100 years of active history you can see on the left hand side of this slide that way back in the second world war uh, 
magnesium was used for uh, tracer bullets, bombs, and the lightweight equipment. Now, notice the word lightweight because at that time, the access to the fossil fuel was very limited to certain countries like Germany, and the light weighting was very important. And this concept has again come back in the last 10, 15 years. Everyone wants to lightweight their materials and their devices. In 1947, which incidentally is also the year of independence of India, we have seen the use of magnesium in commercial aircraft like the Convair aircraft. And in 1950, it was quite extensively used in the Beetle car, and there are a lot of Hollywood movies made on this car actually. So it almost used 20 kg of magnesium in the body frame. Okay. This slide is not moving forward. Okay, yeah, yeah. So how do we choose a material in the perspective of 21st century, the choice of material in the last century was different. And the choice of material in the 21st century and beyond is going to be different. So the main parameters that people use to choose a material is if we go from the top, it is like it should be abandoned. When we say abandoned, that means this material is sustainable. If the material is not sustainable, then you cannot use it for many years and you can develop the technology, but it will go waste in a very short period of time, which is not desirable. Then the material should be non-toxic. In the past century, we have used the materials not knowing it is toxic or not, and that has led to the contamination of our air bodies, water bodies, air, and so many places. And billions of dollars are now being used to clean up these water bodies and everything. So we have lost much more in terms of human health and the health of, in general, all the living beings. Now, the med material can be abundant and it can be non-toxic, but it should also have acceptable properties to be used in engineering and biomedical application. It should be cost friendly if possible, because that is how it reaches to a common man. And then the most important thing, which is a 21st century issue, is that there should not be a geopolitical situation here. That means if one country controls this material, they can call the shots. And if you develop a technology in that material and tomorrow the political relations go haywire, then you will not have an access to that material. And then again, all your developmental efforts can go away. So geopolitical issues are also getting very important now to select a suitable material. So why we focus on magnesium? The four reasons here are listed. You want a happy planet Earth. You need to have wonderful and healthy plants. You need to have happy humans and you need to see the happy animals. So that in a way covers our planet Earth and all the living organisms on the planet Earth. So let's try to see that why magnesium is important for the planet Earth. In recent years, uh, especially from 1990 on onwards, we are noticing a tremendous increase in the global warming. It has become a very serious issue. In Chennai, for example, we have witnessed heavy flash floods in 2015 and we have seen near drought in last year. So apparently this is a what is called as an extreme weather pattern. Sometimes you have floods, sometimes you have drought. In January 2016, for example, we have seen the forest fire in Alberta, Canada, when the temperature was minus 10 degrees centigrade. Why it happened at such a low temperature? Because the air was just too dry. And we have seen the some of the European countries like France sizzling at 45 degrees centigrade in 2019, such temperatures were not visualized in the last century. And these are all the consequences of global warming. So if you look at this picture, for example, what you see here is an iceberg chipping off from the Arctic Circle. And you see the land scale of the iceberg versus the humans standing there. And that is happening more frequently, again, as a consequence of global warming. And because this Arctic ice is thinning and everything, you see that it is turning green in many areas. And this green coloration is attributed to the growth of phytoplanktons in the recent year. So it is all the evidences of global warming. Now, 
many countries started to scramble together in early part of this uh, century and they came out with a Paris Agreement which was ratified in November 2016 and the basic goal was to keep the temperature below 2 degrees centigrade when compared to the pre-industrial level which is reference year 1880 and more emphasis was placed to keep it below 1.5 degrees centigrade because they say that if we reach 2 degrees centigrade then it becomes a tipping point that means the climate change will be irreversible that means practically every living person on this planet will be affected by very unusual weather patterns and that is not what we want to see and apparently current situation is that we are 1.2 degrees C above the pre-industrial level so we have only 0.3 degrees centigrade to work with so to meet this kind of goal to control this temperature rise, the CO2 emission has to be cut down by 2 billion tons by 2025. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the COVID-19 has come as a blessing in disguise because this 2 billion tons will already be taken care of in this year because of the suspensions of air travel, ground transport and everything. So we we happen to cut down by 2.5 billion tons within this year only. But nevertheless, when the economies will open, we may see even higher extent of carbon dioxide emission and we have to control that. So what are the sources of the carbon dioxide emissions, which is a greenhouse gas? It's the electricity sector, transportation sector, and the industrial sector. These numbers, what you see in this slide, keeps changing every year. So, but that essentially shows that these are the three sectors which burn fossil fuels and emit carbon dioxide and in that we are trying our best to come with the solar power options wind power option nuclear power option so efforts are being made but they are not as fast as it should be industry is also taking steps to use the cleaner fuel alternative fuels and all this thing so we are working in that but an area which is very interesting for engineers in general and easy to implement is the transportation sector in the transportation sector you can simply reduce the weight of your vehicles whether it's a plane or a car or a train and once you do that you use less fuel and with that your mileage increases with the reduction in the weight of the vehicle and apparently co2 gas goes down and it is one of the most potential solution. So the European Union, for example, to conform to the Paris Agreement, they uh, made a target to reduce the CO2 emission by 20 to 25%. They pledged that in 2010 for two, up to 2020. So basically they want to cut down from 130 gram of CO2 per kilometer to about 95 gram of CO2 by 2020. We'll see how uh, the report comes out next year and how much they are able to achieve and apparently that correspond to a mileage of 30 kilometer per liter of the fossil fuel that we use now so to give you an idea that how difficult situation we are in besides showing the last few slides is that you have to understand that we have at entered a mass extinction event when you say mass extinction event, it means you lose 70 to 95 percent of plant animals and microorganism species. And this is a six mass extinction event which we have already entered. And unlike other mass extinction events which happen due to the natural causes, this one is caused by the humans. So we are responsible for this mass extinction event. Our CO2 levels are highest in last 800,000 years. Our Arctic Ocean, if we go by the same way, will be ice free by 2030. And this lead to increase in the sea level at a rate of 3.4 millimeter per year. That means most of the countries will lose their sea coast to a greater extent in the years to come and the low lying nations will totally disappear. And of course, from 1990s, when people have started recording the effect of this climate change, they have seen that these figures are like five years back and say that they have already doubled forest fire, droughts, floods, tropical storm and their intensity also has increased when compared to the last century. So now there is something called as a doomsday clock which was last moved forward 
on 26 January, the Republic of India, 2018. 753 m by 30 seconds so we are about two minutes to 12 if that if it is 12 if both the needles are at 12 that means it's a doomsday doomsday means all of us are going to get badly affected in a uh, uh, very serious way and this clock movement forward or backward is affected by the nuclear weapon proliferation because they are weapons of mass destruction climate change and new technologies. So you see here that nuclear weapons is important. Climate change, it affects everyone on this planet and new technology. The new technology, why? Because if you are not responsible in developing new technology, you can contaminate every part of your planet Earth and then it will affect our health and eventually will not be able to live for a longer time. So. Now, you, if you come to the mythological part, the Mayan calendar, which was set up in 3114 BCE, they say the world will end on 21st December 2012. When they say the world will end, means that means you can ex expect some serious events happening on this planet. They don't say that everyone will die. No, you should not take it that way. And if you go to the Indian philosophy, the Kali Yuga ends in 2025 CE. And if you look at this table, 2025. And the Paris Agreement says that you have to reduce the CO2 emission by 2 billion tons by 2025 and keep a control on that. So you see that scientific understanding and the mythological understanding are converging to year 2025. And maybe the God has given a window from 2012 to 2025 to put our act together or face the consequences. Obviously, the younger generation feel more threatened because the people like us have almost lived our life, but the young generation have to live their life and our future generation are also equally important. Their health is equally important. So as a result, you can see a lot of strikes in different parts of the world. They want a green climate. They want no global warming. They want good technologies. Now let's try to see the relevance of magnesium for happy and healthy plants. Now, in the research work done in CSIRO Australia, they have seen that if you grow the plants in a contaminated soil, for example, gold, the gold can be absorbed by the plant and it can enter into the leaves and the transportation system. Even the manganese, you can see all this fluorescence microscopy, all these bright green areas are where the manganese is. And here on the picture on your lower uh, right hand side is the manganese in the leaf and the transportation system of the plant xylem and phloem. So what it tells you that if we do not use the right material, if we do not use the right technology and it contaminates the soil, it enters into our food chain. So you may eat broccoli, you may eat spinach as a healthy food, but the contamination is already inside that. You can wash it, it will not go away. So basically that is going to adversely affect the health of everyone. Now one of the lightweight elements which has emerged in the last century somewhere in 1980s in a very strong way is aluminum. Now aluminum is cytotoxic, that means it's toxic to the human body. So if you are not very careful in the use of dumping aluminum or recycling aluminum, it can get absorbed by the plants if the soil pH is less than 5.5. And in the research done on the buckwheat plant, there says that aluminum can get uniformly distributed in leaves beside the transportation system. And if you look at this picture on your left hand side, you see that the plant on the right hand side has a shorter roots. Shorter roots means a limited or constrained growth of the plants affecting the yield of the plant. And you'll be surprised that 60% of the world potential crop growing soil is highly acidic. So that means if we use aluminum and we do not recycle properly, then we are, will face the issue. On the other hand, if the magnesium goes in the food chain, you can see that magnesium is a nutritional plant, uh, element for the plants also. You have much more root growth and the shoot growth. And apparently you can expect much more nutritional value of the plants. So it is not cytotoxic. So now let's try to see the relevance of magnesium for happy and healthy humans and animals. Now, we have seen evidences that 
if you contaminate the water body like this dog for example was turning blue because the water he was drinking from a canal and that was contaminated by a blue dye and you have seen the movie uh, avengers series and this hulk is a character whose body was contaminated by something and then he turns green and big and unusually freak person so apparently what are these example telling to you is that if we do not control the use of material and technology and contaminate the water bodies in this situation the last example was the soil bodies but in this case the water bodies then again is going to affect the health of all the living organisms so how is the magnesium important for the human health it's a nutritional element it is involved in 300 chemical reaction in the human body. It is required by your muscular system, nervous system, cardiovascular system, immunity system. And if you have a trouble sleeping, you can always take magnesium tablet. It's available in the vegetables, whole grains, beans and nuts. And apparently it is also the fourth most abundant cation in the human body. So body knows how to handle this element. It is next to calcium. Calcium, we need 650 and magnesium, we can take about 400 mg per day without any issues. If you get taken extra, it will be excreted by the body. So it's not an issue. Now, if you look at aluminium, 3.8 million tons of aluminium was generated by in 2017 and 2.7, almost two thirds of that was landfilled. If it enters the food chain, you can expect cognitive deficiency dementia, adverse effect on CNS and reproductive system is linked to Alzheimer disease and other uh, neurological diseases quite well established now. And if you see here, the people who are susceptible, similar to the COVID-19 situation, infants and elderly people and patients with side problems like diabetes, impaired renal function and all these things. So basically it hits the section of the population which are weaker and that is why the world health uh, office is trying to reduce the intake of aluminum as much as possible magnesium can also be used as a medicine to take care of the noisy situation for example in usa 15 percent of the u.s population suffers from tinnitus and apparently if you take magnesium with vitamin c c and d it works as a medicine for that so it is particularly useful especially for the section of the people like soldiers workers and the normal individual who are working in for example factories and all this thing so it it has a good impact on the human health so so body loves uh, magnesium and body needs magnesium and this concept has led to the development of use of temporary implants made of magnesium like stents and like the orthopedic fixation devices which are used in the body and they need not be taken out which i'm going to talk briefly a bit later on magnesium is also very important for electromagnetic shielding electromagnetic waves are generated by practically all the electrical things which are around us like grinder like TV, fridge, phone, laptop, and so on and so forth. And you'd be surprised that electromagnetic pol pollution is the fifth largest pollution after noise pollution, water pollution, air pollution, and the solid waste pollution. It has no boundaries because each of us nowadays in the modern context have a, uh, electronic gadgets to work with like a simple thing is a mobile phone. Every one of us have it. Now what happens is that when you use these devices, these electromagnetic waves are absorbed by the body, currents are um, introduced in the body, which are much beyond the current in our body, and body doesn't know how to handle it, and it creates an adverse effect on the metabolism on the hormone production. So based on these evidence, the World Health Organization has said that this electromagnetic radiation is possibly carcinogenic. And this builds up in the body. It's not like you use it, you don't use it, and it goes away. It gets accumulated in the body. So the damage gets accumulated in the body. So we try to see how magnesium can be a useful element to replace aluminum, which is currently used for electromagnetic shielding and we did the work on radio waves and the microwaves and you can see that in the radio wave zone magnesium is much more superior in EM shielding while in microwave zone it is similar. 
So why should I use magnesium? Because first thing, it will make my phone lighter because it's 35% lighter than aluminum. And number two, I'm replacing a neurotoxic element aluminum with magnesium. So that's a driving force why I should go for magnesium in electronic application. And apparently that is what the scientists are doing. Now the Samsung phone casing is magnesium. Many of the light cameras and the light TV that you use, the frame is made of magnesium so it has multifunctional aspects so where is magnesium it is in the group 2a of the periodic table here in the red square it has certain positive for example it has a low melting point at 650 degrees c its density is the lightest metallic element that can be used for structural application and because of that it has very good specific strength damping electromagnetic shielding it has acceptable ductility, elastic modulus, and the cost. And its only negative point is that it is electrochemically quite active. So if you have to use this element, you have to protect it by the coatings. How does it compare with the workhorses of engineering and medical application like aluminum, titanium, and steel? Now, if you compare this, and if you look at this chart, in terms of density, it is the lightest. In terms of melting point, it is the lowest. So lowest melting point means you need less energy to make it. That means you burn less fuel. So you are helping the climate. Its specific modulus is at par with other elements, and its specific strength is only next to the titanium, where titanium can be five times more expensive than magnesium. It has certain processing advantage, like excellent cost stability and machinability. So that means you can make a product of magnesium faster. If you talk with the people in the industry, they want to make the product faster. It saves on the time and the cost of the manpower. So it makes the product cheaper. So that's why you want to use a material which can be converted into finished product faster and magnesium fits the bill. So are we short of magnesium? Not really. It is sixth most abundant element in the earth crust and third most dissolved mineral in the seawater. And if you look at this table, it is almost 12 times more than that of aluminum. That means if aluminum can last for one century, magnesium can last for 12 century minimum, assuming the rate of consumption is same as of today. If you look at the universe, for example, in the whole universe, you'll be surprised that magnesium is the most abundant metallic element, even more than iron. So apparently that's what I try to tell that it's a God's own element. In the universe, it is very well abundant. In the planets, it is very well abundant. In the human body, it is very well abundant. So it's one of the most favorite element of God. So what happened between 1950 after the Second World War and year 2000 when the people suddenly woke up to use of magnesium? So if you have seen this movie, Finding Nemo, and this Marlene is a character here and the dory with the short term memory loss. So this Marlene represents the scientific community and asking this dory who we, uh, that why you gave up on magnesium. The dory represents the industrial community and it says 50 years of memory loss. But nevertheless, that phase is over and people have started working on magnesium in a very aggressive fashion. And Clear examples you can see in China and uh, South Korea, Japan, Germany is coming up in the biomedical application. Russians are always using it and in USA. So to appreciate more about this thing, as I indicated this figure, it started in 1950 with a body frame. It was also used in the engine component way back in about 1970. So people say that magnesium is flammable, but maybe they do not understand what magnesium is because you need 580 degrees centigrade to ignite magnesium and most of the electronic product that you use in your cars or any body electronic system they are unstable beyond 200 degrees centigrade anyway so magnesium is much better than them according to this lightweight and all this thing the general motor have put the boot area made of magnesium in the car the selling point is very simple. It is 75% lighter than steel and 33% lighter than aluminum. That's the selling point. Let me get rid of this thing here. And if you go to the next slide, you will see another brand name Porsche. Use magnesium in the 
rooftop area and they compared aluminum and the CFRP carbon fiber reinforced plastic and they found that you can have the thinnest and lightest magnesium to replace these two elements so it is also used in the Porsche in year 2016 people for example in South Korea see it's used in the wheels in the steering Maruti Suzuki is using in the steering for a very long time lamp casing if you see it here and many many components within the body of the car so as expected whether the industry tells you or not the magnesium demand is increasing over the years and apparently because the Europe wants to cut down on the vehicle weight in USA they say that the 5 kg of the magnesium that they use in today's car way back in 2010 they want to increase it up to 180 kg by 2020 which is 30 to 100 percent increase so if the country like India which is also a manufacturing hub does not position itself then all these side orders coming from the US and advanced country will go somewhere else and we will lose a lot of money now let's try to have a look at the aerospace sector this picture I showed you before the conveyor aircraft was using it way back in 1947 you have the bomber conveyor B36 which almost used 8.6 tons of magnesium way back in 1940s and 50s Sikorsky helicopter is also using it Lockheed F-80 sea shooting star fighter aircraft was completely made of magnesium no issues Russian bomber used 1.5 tons of magnesium so basically after a lot of persistence from the scientific and research community Federal Aviation Authority of US has lifted the ban on use of magnesium in the commercial aircraft and apparently they say okay fine if it is if it meets the flammability criteria you can use it and the people are targeting the aircraft seats which are made of aluminum to be replaced by magnesium so in the new generation aircraft in next few years you will see that all the seats will be replaced by magnesium and the country like Singapore is also positioning to sell those seats so you see that if it's a narrow body aircraft and you just replace the seat you save on 360 kg of weight while if it's a big aircraft like A380 you save almost 4.2 tons of the weight of the plane and that translates to tremendous fuel saving and the load carrying capability of the aircraft how about the maritime amphibious vehicle the vehicles which can be used in both land and in the water they are also supposed to be light because with the less amount of fuel they can cover long distances and stay in the war zone for a longer time so that is where the magnesium is being used cruise ships engines are already made of magnesium now armed robotic vehicles people are already trying to use the magnesium in the body frame once again they can save up from 17 to 15 percent of the weight depending on the size of the armed robotic vehicles and the countries like Singapore are also positioning themselves and I hope that similar efforts are made in India also so these are only some of the application to for you to understand that if you are talking on magnesium and if I am talking on magnesium why I am talking on that and I have not yet talked about the structural components in electronic sector robotics to make the robots lighter high speed trains the work done in Japan for example they are planning to replace the sleeper bus from, uh, from steel to magnesium and that's going to save a lot of energy and the weight of the trains and your train can move faster inertia effects will be less so in last 20 years we developed two techniques which are quite unique to us to make both aluminum and magnesium based materials so current emphasis is on magnesium you can make any metals using two methods liquid metallurgy method or the powder metallurgy method and in the composite you can put the reinforcement to improve the mechanical response of the material so this is called as a disintegrated multiposition technique which we pioneered in 1995 uh, using the concept of stir casting and the spray automation and deposition we take the material in a crucible we heat the things in case of magnesium to 750 degrees centigrade we homogenize the metal and the reinforcement we bottom pour it so that we can get almost 100% yield 
and when the material is being poured it is hit by the argon gas jet so that it is disintegrated into small droplets and then deposit on the substrate this is a kind of ingot we get you can machine in, in, into billet and also extrude into the rods we have already scaled up to that to 20 kg and that can give you a five foot and about half meter diameter billet which is very very big for the industrial application we also tried the polar metallurgy route because it is another route which is widely used by the industry is quite automated uh, in the industry so in this case again we take the magnesium and the reinforcement we blend it so that we have a uniform mixture you can blend it using a v blender or planetary ball mill you can compact it after that followed by sintering you can do the sintering using the conventional tube furnace or the box furnace or you can use a microwave we use microwave because we want to save energy so what we did was that we took a microwave which is used in the home and create a setup to be put in the microwave where you can see in the center is a billet in inner crucible microwave susceptor outer crucible and the reinforcement and then you pre-calibrate the microwave for the time so for example if i to reach 640 degrees centigrade uh, say for aluminum or magnesium i can reach it in 14 minutes so that means my centering time is 14 minutes that gives me al almost 91 percent saving in the heating duration so i can the turnover time is much faster 90 percent faster and then the energy consumption is 96% lesser in microwave when compared to the conventional mode of heating. So in both ways, I reduce the cost of the product. So how the microwave works is that when you switch on the microwave, the microwaves are absorbed by the metallic compacted billet and heats the billet from inside to outside. And this receptor, which is silicon carbide particles, heat the billet from outside to inside. So you have two heat front, inside to outside, outside to inside. And that is what lead to the energy efficiency. So you can see how the microwave comes in and how the billet can be heated in a very, very quick fashion. And as I say that it's a normal household oven and you can get the center billet, you can extrude it and we don't see any issues with that. Now the processing can be good, the material can be good, but it has to show good mechanical responses and the corrosion response. Then we can say that the efforts are novel, otherwise it is incomplete. Our focus, one of our main focus is on the development of magnesium based nanocomposites. When you say nanocomposite, that means that reinforcement in this situation we are using from micron size reinforcement to nano size reinforcement. So picture on your right hand side, so the dispersion of nano size AL203, so that's why it is called as nanocomposite. So why we use a nano land scale reinforcement? For a very simple reason, if you use a micron land scale and you apply the load, the particle will break or they will debond. And if that happens, then that's a site of crack initiation, then crack will propagate and you will compromise on the strength, ductility, which can be compromised up to 80% and the toughness. So you'll have very low toughness. We don't see these issues with the nano reinforcement. And in case of magnesium, we have seen from all the work we have done that you can improve the ductility, modulus, dynamic properties, high temperature stability, creep properties, wear properties, fatigue properties, dry and wet corrosion resistance, ignition, electromagnetic resistance and also the bioresponse of magnesium. So I'll give you a certain example how it is useful. For example, we were, we were able to disperse nano sized aluminum particles in magnesium. And if you look at this row, which is uh, in the red font here, just by putting 0.5%, very less, we are able to increase the yield strength and the UTS by almost uh, 25 to 50%. And we are able to increase the ductility to one and a half time from 4.6 to 6.2 percent. So this is one type of reinforcement in which you can increase the strength and ductility simultaneously. This is a magic of nano reinforcement. Now let's try to have a look at the ceramic reinforcement such as boron carbide. And once again, you see that in the top table with the 1.74 percent of boron carbide you are able to increase the uh, yield strength uts and your ductility becomes double if you want to triple the ductility just put about one percent boron carbide and you can have wonderful ductility 
not only under the tensile loading, but also in the compressive loading, you're able to increase the strength without compromising on the ductility. And that is, once again, the beauty of nano size reinforcement. We are also involved in the development of the new magnesium based materials and, of course, the nano composite. And if you look at the second row here, we developed this material with four zinc, three gadolinium, and one calcium. And you see the properties are almost tripled up from the compressive yield strength and UCS is almost one and a half time. Failure strain in this situation reduced to half, but remains more than 10%. And of course, the crane size reduced. Now, what is the importance of this thing is that because these properties exceeds the properties of WE43, which is an aerospace grade alloy in terms of strength and ductility. If you talk with the manufacturers, they will say anything beyond 10% failure strain is okay with us. We can shape it into any way. Now you see the magic of nano reinforcement zinc oxide and you see that we are again able to increase the strength by putting 1% ZNO by 100 megapascal. Yield strength another 100 megapascal plus for UCS and your failure strain almost remain the same and beyond 10%. Now what are the importance of these values here? These values means now these values are better than mild steels which are used in the infrastructure application that means you can replace the steels not only aluminum but the steels with magnesium so this kind of work is done not only by us but also there are some other groups who are reporting the similar property so what this trend tells you is that magnesium is not only going to replace aluminum but also the steel now fatigue Failure is one of the failure, one of the three types of failure which is commonly seen in engineering and biomedical application. We did some work with the Professor T. S. Srivatsan, who is expert in fatigue. Once again, in this case, we took a commercial magnesium alloy is at 31 with one volume percent of carbon nanotube, and you see the stress and number of cycle failure curve. And you can see for every stress level, the number of cycles to failure is more. And this is Beside that, we are also getting an increase in the tensile yield strength and UTS and also the failure strain. So we increase not only the performance in the static loading, but also in the cyclic loading. If CNT is expensive for you, you can do with AL203. And again, the response of the composite is better for a given stress. Number of cycles to failure is more in case of composite material. Dynamic behavior very important for the people in the transportation industry because in case of accident your loading is not slow the loading imposed during collision is high strain rate loading so i work with my colleague who is expert in that and the split hopkinson bar usage and we realize for az31 which is a commercial magnesium alloy with the l203 you see this graph and focus on the blue curve here which is unreinforced material and the black curve, which is the nanocomposite material. So you can see an increase in the strength and ductility in case of nanocomposite material. So that will make the transportation sector very happy because now, and under the case of collision, your material will become even stronger. Sometimes you use the material when the temperature can go beyond 45 or 50 degrees centigrade. And most of the Aluminium alloys, for example, are used up to 100, 120 degrees centigrade. So we expect the similar uh, usage for magnesium-based material also. This work we did with Professor Ashish Malik in IIT Dhanbad. He was our former student in National University of Singapore. So in this case, he investigated the magnesium ETS system and till the temperature of 250, which is beyond what we wanted to uh, test. but we found that for every temperature, the performance of composite shown by the blue curve here is superior to the unreinforced material, which is almost one and a half times at 250 degrees centigrade as shown in the table. We also sent some samples to uh, researchers in Germany. Uh, MAGIC stands for Magnesium Innovation Center in Germany with Professor Hart and uh, Arjo Daringer. And we send them a sample which are supposed to be used for uh, high temperature. So instead of aluminum, we use tin here. And you can see that uh, the alloy that we developed has a higher micro hardness when compared to the pure magnesium. The compressive yield strength goes up 
the ultimate compressive strength goes up by 47 percent and the compressive fracture strain remains the same so no compromise on the ductility at 20.5 percent and then we add zinc oxide again we are able to increase the uh, uh, hardness to up to 148 percent to strength 59 percent and ultimate compressive strength to 58 percent and ductility jumps by 34 percent to 27.4 with 27.4 percent ductility you can get or you can manufacture very intricate shapes, very intricate shapes. And these, after these properties, we send it for the creep response. And the blue curve shows that the creep resistance increases for these materials and much better than the unreinforced material. So presence of nano reinforcement also helps in the enhancing creep response. Now, other property of importance for the composite is the dry sliding behavior. And we again work in collaboration with uh, some of our colleagues who are expert in travelogy and we see that just by putting about 1.5 percent of al2o3 you are able to improve the wear resistance by 25 percent and if you add another three percent calcium you increase the performance by another 25 percent so now your life becomes one and a half times of the original life so Again, the nano reinforcement helps by modifying the wear mechanism of the base material. Now, if you have a material, you have to machine it also to put in a system. And some of the machining work we did in collaboration with IIT Delhi quite some time back uh, with Professor Aravindan there. And he wanted to investigate the possibility of uh, machining deep aspect ratio hole, as you can see in the top image here. And his observation was that we can drill high aspect ratio holes, no abnormal arcing, and acceptable surface finish. We also sent in future some of the samples to Newcastle University with the office in UK and Singapore. And they tested a number of uh, magnesium-based composites. And they say that cutting force of all the nanocomposite is lower except for one material, which was magnesium 2.5 ZNO. And that means if the cutting force is less, machining speed is high, again, your product can be made faster from this material. Corrosion is another issue which has to be considered for material selection. So we carried out the dry corrosion uh, characteristics of the material and we see that for case of composite in this light blue color curve here is always lower than that of the base material. And this is attributed to the microstructural refinement, which comes because of the presence of nano reinforcement. Now, in this picture, what you see is that on the right hand side, this layer, the thickness of the oxide layer is thin, is much more compact than the base material. And this is in, it is similar to the observation made by many researchers, for example, in Australia, where they say that by defining the grain size of steels improves the corrosion resistance of the steel. So here also we are doing the refinement of the grain size and by that the diffusion of the ions to heal up the layer is much faster and that's why the dry corrosion resistance increases as a result of presence of uh, nano reinforcement. We also sent some samples to late Professor Bala Subramaniam in IIT Kanpur who investigated the wet corrosion and he realized that the wet corrosion of nanocomposite samples based on AZ31 commercial magnesium alloy was almost one third that of the base matter. And he attributed that to the change in the microstructural condition because of the reduction in the cathodic phases in the microstructure. And to note that the, if you reduce the cathodic phases in the microstructure, you reduce the wet corrosion. So based on a lot of things, we have developed some bubble charts. And in this bubble chart, you see that the y-axis is 0.2% yield strength, x-axis is ductility. Then you have hybrid reinforcement, you have metallic reinforcement, you have ceramic reinforcement, you have DMD technique, you have PM technique. So depending on what strength and ductility combination you want, you can choose the material and you can choose a processing technique. So such kind of bubble charts are available in the market now, not in the market, open literature. Now, there's a big misconception about the ignition temperature of magnesium, as I indicated, that the ignition temperature of magnesium is 580 degrees centigrade approximately. And if you put the nano reinforcement such as SiO2, then the 
ignition temperature increases. Why the ignition temperature increases? The only theory that we have is that it reduces the thermal conductivity. And if you reduce the thermal conductivity of the material due to the presence of nano reinforcement, the ignition temperature goes up. Of course, we are still working to find out is there any other mechanism which lead to the increase in the ignition temperature as a result of presence of nano reinforcement. Biomaterial, emerging market. Germany is doing very good. South Korea is coming in here. Now, to understand how it is coming is that you know that we need implant practically in all parts of the body as you see in this picture. There are two types of implants. Permanent implant where you put in the body like knee implant and the hip implant, you don't want to take it out. You want it for the rest of your life. But if you have a crack in your bone and doctor want to put a nail, you don't need that nail for the rest of your life. Then the doctor go and do one more surgery and remove it once the healing is done. So. The patient has to go two times surgery. The doctor, he has to pay to the doctor two times. So patient trauma increases, the doctor time increases, the medical cost increases. That is where the magnesium comes in. Magnesium is used as a temporary implant. You put in the body, forget about it. The bone will heal and the screws or plate, whatever you put in the body will gradually dissolve in the body and any excess will be excreted by the urinary system without any issues. It does not affect any organs in the body. So before you put an implant in the body, you have to see that its strength is at least exceeding that of the bone and also the ductility so that you are putting a material better than bone. So if you look at this, we tried many nanocomposite reinforced with titanium, titanium dioxide, titanium dioxide, titanium carbide and titanium nitride. And in all the cases, their strength is more than that of the strength of the bone and the ductility of the bone is only up to 2% and these materials have a much higher ductility. That means these materials are much more stronger and tougher than that of the bone and from mechanical point of view, yes, you can put in there. Similarly, from the compressive property, they are all superior when compared to the bone. Then you have to see that how do they react in the human body and based on the Corrosion rate examination in the physiological medium, in this case DMEM plus 10% FBS, the rate was less than 0.1 millimeter per year, which is acceptable by the surgeons, which will serve the purpose of a temporary implant. So having said that, it is not like all the reinforcement work in a similar way, different reinforcement work in different ways. For example, if I go for MGTIO2 system, the green plot here, you will see that if I had to choose it, I will choose 2.5% of TiO2 because for 50 days, it does not affect much of the pH. Increase in the pH means more corrosion. So I will choose 2.5% TiO2 while I'll choose only 2% of titanium carbide as you see in the sky blue graph. And in this one, the purple one, you will see that I will again choose 2% of titanium nitride. So essentially, once again, nano reinforcement helps, but the different type, again, you have to do the test and ensure that they are, what amount is suitable. So we are also working with some dentists to see how it can be used in the repair of the jaw, mandibular usage. And we gave them the samples of magnesium with nano hydroxyapatite. They did the test and from the test, they say that the cell viability is more than 75%, which is a requirement to tell that your material is non-toxic. So all the materials or nanocomposite magnesium nanohydroxyapatite qualified that uh, test. And they also did the cytotoxicity test using another way, which is a lactate dehydrogenase release test. And again, they found that most of the materials that are tested have zero cytotoxicity or only in one case, you have mild cytotoxicity, which is acceptable. It should not have moderate or high cytotoxicity. So 25% is a limit and this one in this case has about 27% which is acceptable. We also tried the hollow silica nanosphere and again you see that you can see the increase in the strength and also the increase in the hardness and if you look at the corrosion rate which is very low so that means not only the one which I've shown you you can also use a silica nanosphere as a nanocomposite for biomedical application. So what we are moving on from here is that we also want to make the magnesium even lighter. So that means we can use alloying element like lithium and we can make the metal float in the water. So you can see that 
this one is almost floating in the water and we are still trying to reach or approach the density of about one gram per cc which is of the water so that you can see it on the surface of the water at this point of time it is at the surface but not above the surface you want to see it above the surface so that's the way we are moving on so in conclusion i would like to say that magnesium has or magnesium based material including nanocomposite it need not be only composite but even the magnesium based material they have very strong potential in engineering and biomedical application and it's extremely important that of the our research community and the industrial community move in that direction position in that direction so if someone comes for the help in anything to us we are able to do that and capture the market we don't need infrastructure costs to put it because when you are in the industry you don't want the things to be too expensive all the infrastructure thing that you need are of very nominal cost you can even convert your aluminum plant partially into magnesium plant with very minor changes you don't need too much changes in there nanoparticle is one way of improving the multiple engineering and biomedical properties as i have shown you many many example people are also working on amorphous and hollow reinforcement because this is not the end we still have a lot of scope to improve on so in nutshell my message is the magnesium technology has arrived china as i say china south korea japan and russia have positioned themselves very well canada is coming up in the extraction side us is also coming up but india is still way behind we have seen some of the activities happening in india but it is not to that level as you will see in china which controls 80% of magnesium market so i think it's a high time that other countries such as india which is also a very big country takes a proactive role in promoting this kind of research so before i end i'd like to thank all my students who made this work possible over last 15 20 years and i thank you for that and that is how i conclude if you have any question please uh, ask me yes sir uh, sir thank you so much uh, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation so i think this will be a great eye opener for the people those who are yep. working in materials so even though i have been working on titanium uh, 64 for the past 10 years i was not much more aware about titanium so so first of all this is a very good i have seen only the mechanism in periodic table i did not yeah. so <laughs> so this is a very big eye opener and i uh, believe that uh, so i i am getting so many messages from the researchers those who are uh, attending the webinars yeah they are saying that sir this is a very good uh, they will help us for the research and thank you so much for nice presentation sir and uh, let me look into the uh, chat box for questions okay uh, chat box is i, I will me... take us i will take us uh, let me check okay okay maybe you can read the question then i can answer it from here okay. yes yes sir i will do that i will do that sir uh, sir mr uh, uh, ritesh tiwari asked one question yeah sir how we can reduce the eff effect of drag force by using magnesium for manufacturing automobile components how you can reduce the drag for drag force drag force see uh, that is basically this is more of a fluid mechanics question only thing i can answer is that it makes your vehicle lighter and i think if it makes your vehicle lighter it can move faster so when you have to reduce the drag force or the motion of the fluids around your body that comes with the design aspect of that so uh, as an example when i was talking with the people in uh, in singapore see uh, i'm just giving an analogy that in the air, airplane the seats are made of aluminum and they have to put magnesium in there so they say that because the properties are different like modulus and uh, uh, that density they have to redesign the seats now so most likely your question means you have to redesign some of the things when you take magnesium in and replace aluminum with magnesium because again the modulus and other thing may change a bit so you may have to redesign that is what i can answer yes sir yes sir yes sir thank you sir thank you thank you for uh, this uh... 
Sir, uh, Mr. Uh, CK had asked one question. Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, I have one doubt. So, corrosion, corrosion rate of magnesium composite increases with increase uh, in rain, with the reinforcement materials. So, can you clarify why? Okay. It depends on what kind of reinforcement you are using. Uh, if you use a micron size reinforcement, you may be right. But when you look at the nano size reinforcement, our results are that, that in most of the situation, the corrosion rate does not increase. And one of the main reason is uh, it refines the grain size. So that is a possible explanation. Now, what happens is that maybe the system that you have investigated and your reinforcement is acting as a cathode, then by putting the micron size reinforcement, which you normally put to 10%, 20% and so, you are increasing the cathodic area. And when you increase the cathodic area, your corrosion will go up. But when you use a nano reinforcement, for example, in the examples which I have given to you, is you use only like 1.5% 2%. So it's dominating effect of microstructural changes overrides its cathodic effect of increasing the rate of corrosion. So that is why we have seen an improvement in the wet corrosion resistance of this material. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And uh, um, so Avinash has asked one question. Uh, sir, uh, can you explain about the different type of hollow reinforcements? Okay. Uh, this is a new work which we are doing. Uh, you can have, there is in the market, you have a few type of reinforcement, hollow reinforcement such as AL203, uh, SiO2. And the easiest and cheapest reinforcement, if you can work, is the fly ash, which is commonly known as Sinosphere. So we are also investigating all these three type of reinforcement and seeing that to what extent they can use. Now, when you use the hollow reinforcement, you want to make your material even lighter. That is one way. In that, you go with the higher size of the reinforcement. If your aim is to reduce the, or increase the energy absorption capability, then I will say go for the micron size. So you have to do the uh, Google search. You will see that at least there are five or six type of manufacturer who are supplying the Hollow reinforcement now. You can easily get that on Google. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, uh, sir, another question has been asked by uh, Mr. Ritesh. Sir, uh, sir, how will be the effect of thermal stresses on real life of magnesium, sir? Like any other matter, um, magnesium, as I've shown you in the oxidation resistance, it, it, its oxidation resistance is quite reasonable. Uh, and if you look at the alloys of magnesium, because normally we don't use the pure metals, it is quite well used, like AZ31 alloy is already there in automobile in many, many areas. But of course, if you want to use it, magnesium as an internal wall of the combustion chamber, then uh, answer is no. BMW has used magnesium. They made the hybrid engines in which they use the inner shell of aluminum and outer shell of magnesium. So. If you look at that, the temperature in an engine in a car can reach between 550 to 600 degrees centigrade, typically. And there's no issue of using magnesium as an outer shell. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir thank you. Thank you so much. And no problem. Uh, for uh, spending your valuable time, even though you, you, you were very busy. No, no, it's okay. It's My pleasure. pleasure. Yes, sir. Great pleasure uh, on behalf of Chinese technology uh, to propose thank. And uh, so, sir, it is uh, amazing presentation. Uh, certainly, thank this you. will work. Uh, this will be eye opener for the all the researchers. And and uh, we, we would like to see you again okay. in another wonderful forum. Definitely. Sir. Yeah. Thank you so much. Really sure. Okay. Yeah. See you. No, I say. Yeah. So I'm going to switch. Uh, dear participants, thank you so much. So we will uh, uh, meet at uh, one forty-five. So the next lecture will be uh, by uh, Dr. Supriya Gangali from Grandfield University. And uh, so this lecture is very uh, amazing. And certainly, I, I hope this will be uh, greatly useful uh, for those who are going to do research. Even I, I personally feel 
very good to do something, some research on mechanism since the SAR has covered the mechanism with uh, titanium. I am already working with titanium, so this will be uh, highly useful to me also and for all of us participants too. So thank you so much. So uh, uh, no feedback form will be sent. So feedback form will be sent at the last I mean by tomorrow and the certificate will be issued along with the feedback. And uh, so uh, those who did not join, those who are not joined in uh, what we call uh, WhatsApp group, please join uh, immediately. So this that will uh, give the uh, faster uh, communication. And uh, and thank you so much. Thank you. So we will uh, meet at the 145. Thank you. Thank you.